Hello everyone, welcome back to Pro VTV. Thank you very, very much for joining me today. We've got a big picture look at a brand of LED tube lighting called Quasar Science, who I'm sure a lot of you have already heard of. They've been on the market for many years now. We actually did a video on them very recently. Uh, I've got them behind me. I'm actually being lit entirely by Quasar tubes. I've got a big double rainbow as my key light. I've got a smaller double rainbow as my backlight, and I've got these two sim rainbow twos in the, in the background. Um, but it's not just to, here to admire my lighting. We've got the CEO of Quasar Science um, joining us, Mr. Stephen Strong. Thank you so much for joining me, Stephen. Thank you for taking the time You're out of welcome. your day for this. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So as we go, everyone watching, um, feel free to leave any questions that you might have um, as we go. This is a very, very informal chat. We've got no PowerPoint slides. We've got no set agenda, really. We are just going to chat, a fireside chat, if you like, about the brand, about how it started, about Stephen, about his work in the industry, um, and any questions that, of course, you guys might have as we go. Um, let us know if anyone watching this already uses Quasar Science Tubes. That would be very interesting to hear. Um, or if you are completely new to the brand or maybe you use a competing LED tube, let us know what you do for your lighting in the, in the live chat as we go. Um, but how long has Quasar Science been going now, um, Stephen? Uh, we started back in 2013. We, we, okay. we started before that, really, as far as working towards having a company. Um, but I would say that the real inception happened uh, around 2012, 2013. Um, we, were, we were working on a show called True Blood. Yeah. Uh, it was the HBO show. Um, I was the rigging gaffer on it. Uh, my partner, Evans Brown, was the... Um, the, he eventually was a DP on the show, actually, cinematographer on the show, and my other partner, Ray Gonzalez, was one of the gaffers on the show as well. And um, we were working together for a few years, kind of talking about what we might want to do to get into this whole LED world. And then finally, in 2012, we started realizing that LED light bulbs themselves, as much people making LED fixtures at that point, obviously, um, but... LED light bulbs kind of became something that we thought people would need and that mm. really was like where we we realized okay Quasar Science is going to be a motion picture LED light bulb company and that's kind of where it started. Yeah because the first products were you know effectively bulbs which you put into existing fixtures right? Yeah, that's right. So we made everything from like medium base, like E27 or 26. I'm not mm. sure what, which one you guys use over there off the top of my head. but 27s, um, yeah, the screw-ons. Yeah, right, yeah. So like medium base, I guess we call uh, mm. uh, Edison base uh, yeah. uh, bulbs. And we started to make these tubes as well. We wanted to make T8 and T12 retrofit tubes for kind of like Kino flows and different fluorescent fixtures, troughers, you know, whatever you name it. Of course, the tubes wound up taking off. They were really um, the thing that kind of made the company, you know, your customers often decide what kind of company you are. And that, that sure. was people really liked using the, the, two, the, the tubes for sure. And in the early days, who were your customers? You know, were you selling them? Did you start straight away selling them on a sort of international market that you do nowadays to everyone who wants to buy them? Or did you have a more sort of select group of, you know, word of mouth people in the industry that, that took them on? How did, it, how did it work? It was a little bit of both. International right away was hard for us because mm. what we were doing is uh, back, back then – Everybody was still using a lot of um, dimmer packs and things like that. So were there dimmer channels all around the mm. all around the industry? So we thought we should make dimmer compatible LED bulbs so that everything dims smooth and stuff like that. So we we started trying to make LED lights that worked with the existing infrastructure, um, mm. and so that's kind of where everything went. Um, a lot of big movies would use our bulbs because they dimmed well and the color was so good. Mm. And I think um, that's kind of where it all started. 
uh, on that level. We had everybody from big movies down to little projects using this stuff pretty much right away. We did have a lot of word of mouth, which was a great part about being in the industry. A lot of people uh, got to see the lights right away that we work with and adopted them quite fast. I, I really enjoyed um, working with a lot of my friends at the time just to try and test out what, you know, whether the, the light color was any good and whether the dimmer compatibility was any good. Color must have been a huge thing for you guys at the time because back back then, you know, 2013 or whenever it was, the 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 LED lighting market was very different to how it is now. Nowadays, pretty much across the board, affordable, high end, you know, the color accuracy, at least when you buy the light at the low end, <laughs> it drifts over time. But um, but what is pretty good, you know, very high TLCI and CRI scores across the board for the most part. Back then very different story you know if you had an affordable fixture in led the color was often very what's the polite word mediocre <laughs> yeah at best at best it was funny for for us at the time we were stoked about led lights uh, uh light panels had already been around for mm. a long time um we had friends that uh started a company called light gear yeah, uh, yep. and and light gear is quite uh, popular as well, um, especially in the U.S. I think that um, we had wanted to lift less cable. Really, is what it was, right? Uh, you know, we were kind of sick of doing that. We saw all these people. Uh, uh, another good friend of ours named Ray Wolf, who owned a company called Bardwell McAllister. If any of your viewers know anything about lighting history, Bardwell McAllister is one of the original. Fresnel companies and lighting companies that Hollywood kind of had. So Ray bought that brand at one point and was pushing it and making all these great new lights. Um, and eventually he started this offshoot company called MacTech LED. Um, and MacTech was really the first LED tube, comp tube company for sure. Mm. Um, and, and that kind of helped us start to think about all these different light bulbs we could make for, uh, uh, you know, whether they were going to go in fixtures or retrofit fixtures or all of that, it kind of happened really fast in those couple of years. So everyone was struggling with color. I mean, everybody was still trying to figure it out. Batch to batch things would still be different. A lot of the companies didn't have consistency. So we delayed releasing our lights for over a year just trying to dial that color spectrum in and not mm -hmm. have i mean really consistency was one of the first things that we had going quasar is probably um i think i'm not misspeaking when i say we were one of the first companies to nail good color period um, and that was a really great step forward. We got really lucky with that. We kind of just stumbled upon that mixing, just continuing to work with the phosphors and mix everything and try and get that, you know, everything had so much green in it. At the time, there were DPs I worked with. They said, I'll never use LED lights. Never. Yep. Ever will you see it on my set. Now, of course, they all use LED lights. But <laughs> I mean, it's too hard not to nowadays. I mean, it... It, it, it's become the lighting equivalent of wanting to shoot on, you know, film. You know, sure, you can still do it. Of course you can still do it. But it has to become a real conscious decision that I am going to shoot this one on film. You know, I'm not going to shoot this one on digital. I am going to shoot this one on film. And it's sort of become the same thing in the lighting world. <laughs> you know, I am not going to use LED on this project because LED is just so much more convenient. And the other thing that's massively driving it forward for our customers is being in at all conscious of the climate because the amount of power that you use with led lighting compared to tungsten or hmis or any of that is just day and night difference um so it is very hard to not use leds <laughs> nowadays yeah it it is but you would be surprised probably how many big productions still use incandescent uh, mm. lights because well look you know there's a lot of equipment out there still that, you know, it can't just all be thrown in the trash. It's very valuable and useful still. Um, sure. it, and, and as we, you know, slowly replace it, it's, it's the same thing with overall, you know, utilities in general. You know, you're going you're gonna to have to have this medium 
zone where we use a little bit of both for a while before we can completely come over to these yep. other systems. Um, I, I think that also a, a big kind of plus that we have going on is a lot of municipalities now are like banning diesel generators and that'll help drive everybody mm -hmm. to more efficient um, kind of technology as well. I mean, LEDs are just getting to that point now where they're so bright for the power that everyone is starting to figure out how to get around using those bigger HMI fixtures and things like that, regardless of the limitations it imposes on them. It's starting to become now like, okay, I can make up that same volume of light with LED lights if I get tricky with it. And so I think people are really kind of starting to get a hang of how to take the instruments that, you know, we, we have an idea of the lights that we want to make for everybody and we think that they're going to be useful, so forth and so on. But, you know, you can get everything on set. I mean, let's be honest. What's the truth? Five in the morning, it's raining outside, you're opening up the truck full of lights. No one's excited. It doesn't matter if there's, you know, the brand new whatever in there that everybody is stoked about. No, it's wet. It's raining. You didn't have coffee yet. So there's no excitement for using these lights. You just have to kind of deploy them and hope that they don't, um, you know, pardon my language, screw you over. Uh, so I think that's the best as manufacturers that we can ask for is that our lights like are actually useful and they don't cause more problems than they're worth practical tools i mean everything around about these lights that um i've got lighting me now which are the first quasar lights that i've i've really played with so um quite lucky that i've jumped straight in at the the new generation um but everything about them seems to be designed with practicality in mind you know is this a practical tool to work and fit into into pretty much any production um is is that right i mean we talked a little bit about your ethos when you got started in terms of color being a driving force and fitting into existing fixtures now we fast forward to nearly 10 years now to um to the current generation the double rainbows the rainbow twos you know is, is that still the same ethos it, has things changed a little bit where are you sitting now i think that i think we well, first of all, I'm never happy with my own <laughs> products, so that's that's the truth, and that's something that I like about myself, actually. Um, uh, always on to kind of trying to make it better, and that's the great thing that we have with the Double Rainbow and the Rainbow 2, is we've made them a lot more future-proof than, mm -hmm. than our past lights. So we're constantly coming up with new ideas that, that we can do with the firmware, for instance, that make the light do this or that, that we didn't even have any idea that we were going to be able to do that when we first kind of really thought of what the light could be. So that is kind of something we're stoked about. We're discovering things about the lights that are great that we didn't really even at first realize. One of the big things that with, with our lights, we... We're a workflow solutions company, in essence. That's kind of what we feel is the ethos of the company. Is like, we want to just make workflow solutions. It doesn't matter. Like, we make a little plastic pallet box that you put power distribution on. It's not a light. It makes everything stay up out of the water and out of the rain, and we sell a bunch of those things. So it's really for us about trying to make common needs in the industry. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to our lights, originally... When people started taking the LED tubes, they started doing all these great things with them, using them really like light bulbs, like they're putting them up in soffits and kind of uh, building big soft boxes out of them. They're filling the soft box with the tubes as a giant, you know, kind of light uh, and all of this stuff. They started using our tubes as, as panels, really. Um, something really unique that people don't often think of with linear LED lights is that if you put them horizontal, you, you actually get the kind of field of light that that you would get out of a similar bounce or or or, or diffusion uh, frame out of it so it's a great way in small places like in a small hallway if if you're looking for aperture which is really obviously important for a big soft effect to make a light look like it's really mm -hmm. big and back and all of that stuff you can really achieve that with our tubes just by putting them 
you know, horizontal. That is exactly what I've done here with my key light. So my key light is a, is a double rainbow four foot, that must be. Um, and yeah, it's a really nice soft light. You know, if I put my hand in front of my key light, you know, I've not got this hard shadow on me. It's, it's, it, it works really well, I think. Yeah, you can work that angle too to kind of have the light be your key and your fill at yep. the same time, which is fun. But also we have an eight foot tube, the Q100R2. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. eight feet long. So if you bring it right in close to some, well, not that close, of course, but if you bring it right in, you know, close to somebody, you get this huge broad source out of it that is softer than anything that would be like a four by four, for sure. instance. Sure. Um, so that's a kind of technique that not a lot of people, a lot of people like to use the tubes and backgrounds and stuff like that. Back to your question, really. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to make a low profile lighting fixture that could easily fit in your car. You can pack a ton of them into the back of a Prius and then you can still have a pretty big lighting kind of uh, package that you can deploy at that point. Um, a lot of times people are dimming these bigger 400 watt fixtures down to 10%. So you don't really need that output all the time. You just need a certain amount of, I, I call it, to, Something stupid that I've been saying lately is is distributed wattage. So you <laughs> okay. might need you might need a fixture to have all of its 400 watts in a in a tight packed spot so that you can then kind of project that outward in the, that way. Sure. But when you're talking about doing area lighting where you need to light like the backyard or do these kinds of bigger like kind of make it seem more like the sky or or things like that you want to try to spread your wattage out in a thinner veil, if you will, to kind of, you know, make more bang for your buck, to be honest with you. Because, again, you're going to have these fixtures down at 10% because you just need to cover the area. You don't really need the wattage. Our, our tubes are great for that because of the way their infrastructure is. Um, they're perfect for rigging in that kind of distributed way. So, again, we kind of design them to be kind of overall... Uh, light bulbs practical not practicals i yes. should write that down somebody write that down practical, they're practical not practicals, not practicals. I like can i change the title of this stream midstream <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. i mean when you're talking to customers do you find that your customers are using them like i'm using them here as led panels you know as a as a source light or are they using them like i've got here behind me as you know, the practicals, the, the, the music video style in light effects. I think, I think it's probably 50, 50, really. Right. I mean, we, we, we promote people using them as source lights. Yes. Um, they also are great lights. Like I said, to, to have on hand when you have to put something in a really tight spot, hallways, you know, up, splashing up a wall, we, we kind of didn't design them necessarily to be on camera in the sense that they're not, incredibly beautiful to look at you know sure. it's more about the practicality of them as uh, source lights in, in that sense but also with the fact that we put this kind of pretty nice set of electronics in it that the pixelation is smaller pixels than a lot of the other products on the market so you can make anything from those beautiful like kind of you know like they do in music videos where you do some kind of great effect yeah, in the like background. Like, yeah, it's, exactly. exactly. Um, um, I think they're really screen, great so. for that. So well, for, with, with these, I mean, what, what is, what is the main reason that this technology has been interesting to you guys? Cause this is, this is something pretty new that we're seeing in L the led world is, you know, RGBs pretty, pretty well established now, but this pixelated RGB is something that's pretty new. Yeah, I think, well, let's just say virtual production. Yeah, right? I mean, that, that, that is, when I was it. making my video, that's what I put down. And I've got absolutely no experience <laughs> in that world <laughs> at all. But I was looking at the DMX channels. I was looking at that pixelated. I was thinking, if you're syncing this up with, a, with one of those, you know, Mandalorian style vir virtual w walls behind you, and you're syncing the lighting into the same visual effects package, these must be the best things on the market, right? Um, well, I, 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 I would like them to be the best thing on the market. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't make too many claims like that. But uh, 
Um, what I do know is that, let me hit a couple bullet points on this, mm -hmm. where what we had was we knew we needed a DMXable tube, and by DMXable, we knew it had to be direct DMX. All of kind of the bigger movie rigging gaffers, for instance, were asking for that. They were like, I just need a, 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 a light stick that I can put in salt boxes and do all these big ladder rigs and light backings and do all of this stuff, but I need to be able to just have direct DMX just like any other light. So that was the number one thing that we started with when we were kind of developing the original rainbow, for instance. And then that was just single pixel. Um, we didn't have the experience, honestly, to, to kind of design uh, uh, multi-pixel stuff for, for a minute. So that took a lot of uh, work right there. Um, but what started to happen is that we started seeing companies start to lean in this direction of kind of having the ability to do video input into the lights and things like that. So we were mm. starting to say, all right, well, then that means you need to go ArtNet and, or streaming ACN straight into the light then if we can do DMX straight into the light. So that's where we started to say, well, why have all this extra architecture that you have to have in your rig in order to put separate ethernet nodes and network switches in order to be able to run your lights on data rather than dmx we were thinking well not why not just build all that straight into the light and then they're future proof at that point it doesn't matter what data protocols you're using they can accept anything right so that's kind of where that came from the pixelation was then this other leap forward where we kind of we knew virtual production was happening. We knew that this whole video wall thing was going on, but the LED volume hadn't really totally cemented as what it was going to mean to the industry yet. And so for pixelation, we were just thinking way better effects, you know, way better fire. You're going to need one light. I mean, we used to, we used to take it. I think we lost. You got no, feedback? Back. <laughs> I'm back, Probably. everybody. <laughs> um, but we, uh, we had um, all these rigs where we would wire like 1,000 watt incandescent bulbs in series and then you would have them kind of in a bunch of different uh, dimmer channels and then you would flicker all that to make a convincing fire because one light just flickering does not look like convincing fire. So we knew with the pixelation, we were like, all right, well, you're going to have the most realistic cop light or fire or emergency light or any of that stuff. So that's kind of where that all came. And then with we just realize suddenly that the conjunction of those two along with the form factor of the lights where you can multiply them into what amounts to a high output low resolution video screen so now when you need to have this interactive lighting with these led volumes you can either do a giant sky rig where you have clouds and everything moving over you can just do a little campfire rig to light the actor to make it seem like the campfire is right there from you, one you tube to basically a thousand tubes you suddenly are able to to do this so it's kind of Absolutely. like this virtual production compatibility that we have in the lights is it's almost like destiny to be quite honest with you in that sense because it makes so much sense so say i've got a virtual environment and in my virtual environment in front of me someone's meant to be shining a light at me and i'm the actor that's being filmed and the, the wall behind me is the cave or whatever you know say that that software can track where this virtual torch is coming from and it can point it at that dmx channel right there but then if you're just doing single channel tubes you've actually got quite a large lighting fixture that's representing that tiny thing but as with this you could have like two of you the 24 pixels or whatever right turning on to be that you get so much more subtlety totally and well and speaking of dmx i with the the limitations of dmx are crazy that's 512 channels per universe well the double rainbow, the RR100, that would be the four-foot double rainbow, at its max profile, it has 480-something channels. That's a universe right there. We, we used to only have one universe of lights per stage on a movie. Now, of course, it's, it's crazy, but, yeah. but immediately that's why we started thinking, well, we're going to have to have a way to control these things that's not DMX at that yeah, point. So again, we kind of and... stumbled in this great set of features that's going to be perfect for virtual production. I don't know any other light out there that can kind of have the trifecta 
if you will, that um, <laughs> no joke to our triangle logo. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Everything's threes here at Quasar. It's how we get this. Just think in threes, everybody. You'll know. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, these lights are going to be a lot of fun for people as just general kind of rigging instruments. I mean, here's the other thing that's great to use these tubes for. You, you have to light catering as well and base camp and all of that stuff. You know, uh, I, we used to keep a bunch of thousand watt incandescent lights on the truck for just general work lighting and now I know a lot of people will just grab one of our crossfade tubes because they're they're affordable and they're easy um, they, you buy them on your petty cash budget practically and then you have a bunch of work lights that don't take up so much room on the truck mm -hmm. which is very important mm -hmm. it's very important it's important for all sorts of I mean for people who aren't used to that sort of environment you know thinking of a production of that size the space is the issue you know just is a bit foreign to them whereas space is always an issue whether like you said before you're one person sticking it in the back of your prius or whether you're a big production with a lighting truck space is always at a premium at all times but there's also the fact that people often don't and you can even have your your, your fights with your producers about this which you only use about 20% of the lights on the truck at any one time. Yeah. They're all there in case you need them or, you know, you know, there's always those days where you empty the truck, of course, because suddenly we lose the light or whatever kind of thing. But for sure, you only use a few of the lights at a time. You're out in the daylight, you're using your HMI package, all the tungsten's just sitting on the truck, you know, resting. <laughs> it's getting mm -hmm. some, some time getting off. Some dust. Uh, so that's always important to remember, um, definitely. And quasars, I think, help reduce the amount of lights that you need on the truck because they are so versatile, which is a kind of big win. A lot of the lights that are coming out now from all the brands are a lot more useful than they used to be. Um, whether, whether you light with hard lighting or soft lighting, you're starting to get a lot more efficient kind of just look at all the soft goods that are coming out for lights now too. these kind of systems that help the grips. I mean, over in the UK, you have a little bit of a different system for lighting than we do over here. Our grip department also takes care of all of the, as you might know, they take care of all the flagging and like sh yeah. shaping of light. Um, so a lot of the new soft goods systems that go right on the light are helping them as well have a faster set around. I mean, what do we know about filmmaking? It's all about speed. So I think that's, you know, if you nowadays, especially if you're a cinematographer and you can get the look you want fast, you're going to get more work than the guy that gets even a better look than you do really slow. Okay. So that's yep. efficiency for sure. Massively so. So we've talked a little bit about the RGB technology. We've talked about um, the work in visual productions and DMX and all that sort of stuff. Um, the bit that we haven't talked about is the workflow when just physically rigging it because that was another thing that really jumped out at me using these for the first time is that osseum rail system that you've got mm. going on on the back so if we just show my laptop quickly this is the um the range of of tubes and every single light on the back of it has so that's the front and the back of a light um has this it's like a nato rail effectively um in fact, it kind of is a NATO rail, isn't it? Um, that goes along the back. Yeah. And there's all sorts of things that clip onto that for you to rig it however you need to. Which, it, it's a really simple but very, very practical solution. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about this system. How did that come about? I, th I think for us, we wanted... First of all, we wanted something that was going to be robust in the situations that at least I know we put the lights through. So mm. a lot of times, um, you know, you have your lights in the aerial lift, for instance, if you have a big rig and what we call a condor over here, cherry picker, you know, big aerial lift coming down on those things and they're like rocking and doing all sorts of you know and catches or, them and <laughs> yeah if you're on a process car um you know bouncing down the road on a process trailer and you got all your lights rigged so it, it can become even if your lights aren't very um big lights if they're not big heavy lights they still need to be rigged like very kind of robustly so that they don't just shake their way out of <laughs> the the rig 
So we put the NATO rail in the back. Good eye there. It is a NATO rail shape, so you can put a lot of other camera accessories on it that have that same kind of NATO rail clamping profile mm -hmm. that you see there. So that's another kind of cool thing if you have a bunch of um, uh, NATO rail accessories, slide it right on there. Um, we wanted everything to be able to bolt to each other. So almost in a ridiculous manner, all of the osseum parts can bolt together in some way likely ways you would never use it maybe you can have your kids play with them it'd be a fun toy um but definitely they um they have a lot of great use we wanted to be able to adapt to all sorts of different rigs a lot of times with with soft boxes and stuff you're just like kind of running quick pipes across to be able to rig the tubes really fast so you were with with our new system you can place your mounting point wherever you need. So if you're making any kind of architectural kind of shapes or doing anything like that, you can kind of, like, you can make organic shapes on square infrastructure kind of because of the way everything slides and the way it rotates so that that way it's easier for you to attach wherever you have the infrastructure mm -hmm. and still kind of get the light where you need it versus where that infrastructure might be um, placed. I, I, um, I, I like the system a lot and we're going to have more stuff coming out in the future that that kind of uh, expands on on what it is already so i'm, I'm looking cool. forward to some stuff that we have coming out in the next couple few months mm, look forward to seeing what that is um and, and i think your point about mounting it very sturdily is a really important one just something as simple as having two mounting points on one fixture in the lighting world isn't done very often no you know normally you have a yoke and you have one fixture going into that yoke um whether no matter even you, you need it to be sturdier you just have a bigger <laughs> yoke and you have a baby pin and all the rest yeah. of it um right. but it's still one mounting point whereas with these you know you could have six different mounting points along the back exactly um and and mount other things we we have a uh, we have a, a plate um that is our, our battery plate, but an auxiliary use for it is that you can use it to bolt two tubes together as well. So you can kind of make a, uh, an array out of them. I mean, oh, cool. again, yeah. you, because of the way the system works, you can really bolt everything to everything. The rotator block is one of my favorite things we mm. have. It's like that mini little grip head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, you can flip it and go back to back with them. And then it becomes a little okay. double grip head with rosettes, so it won't spin out on you and all this stuff. Mm. So you can use it to rig all sorts of stuff that's not lights um, and, and stuff like that. So the system kind of works for whatever. Plus it has um, a one-inch thread. Um, we call it the vampire bite, but it's a one-inch thread distance, which is just standard American cheese plate-like kind of sizing. Um, so it pretty much goes with camera gear, all over the world because it has that same kind of build so that's another great part about the it'll all bolt on to most of the camera gear that you have yeah which is useful you know if you've got the smaller tubes and stuff like that you could attach them to cameras you could attach them to gimbals you could do whatever you wanted with them really couldn't you um i i guess productions must just buy a bunch of these these little mounting adapters to just have like a little meccano set ready to go whenever they need it right yeah, definitely. I think it's useful to have. We have the little battery plate that you can throw on, which I mentioned, of course, but now use it actually for battery on the back. Uh, th that gives you the ability to swap the battery really fast and not have to change out the whole fixture. A lot of the, I mean, we even make some uh, uh, tubes with batteries inside, and they're really useful mm. for that portable use. But, um, but in my opinion, for a professional's day shooting you need to be able to like keep batteries on charge swap out batteries yep, so yep, that you yep. have that light always available but to you when you need it to be battery. super super portable like uh, you're walking along with it with the steady cam shot or something like that you know right. always useful to have it light if you're booming it above <laughs> if you're the poor guy holding the boom pole with one above it walking backwards it having mm -hmm. a built-in battery is quite useful yeah well i think i think a great thing i think a great thing with 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 this system that we've developed is you can throw on like a nice a nice anton anton bauer mm -hmm. uh micro battery with a 150 watt hour kind of like the, these things will run our tube all day long basically because our tubes are fairly efficient so you can 
swap that thing, or I mean, pop that thing on there and probably be running all day without having to swap it. But when you do have to swap it, it's really fast. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. So should we talk a little bit about, about you and the rest of the team there? Because you, you started it with a few of you, right? What's the team look like nowadays? Well, yeah, we started, it was just four of us in the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. And we were all lighting technicians. And then we brought uh, our CTO, Ben Dinas, is a lighting console programmer or lighting programmer, as they call him now. Um, we, everybody in the company has some kind of experience on set. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody, actually. I'm pretty <laughs> sure everybody has some experience on set. Um, our repair technician, Sean, for instance, he used to work on sets and does a bunch of lighting and he used to work at expendables, uh, um, expendable stores and all this different stuff. So everybody has some connection to the industry that, that now works in the company. So that was a big kind of important thing for us is to really reflect what was going on out there and to know, have kind of domain over what we were talking about. Um, uh, so that's kind of where we were at. And now, um, we are part of a much bigger family of of really wonderful people. Actually, we're having a great time with that. So um, that's a, a big plus for us now with the big team that we have. We can do a lot more for the customer and uh, bring out even better lights. Absolutely. So, I mean, you were telling me before we started a little bit about some of your background um in the film industry um but you mentioned everyone has got experience in the film industry what what's yours have you worked on anything we might know yeah um i started in 1995 um and i got in the union pretty quick which is a lucky thing especially back then mm -hmm. there was a lot of big movies going on at the time and uh everybody was kind of working uh, a lot at that at that period so uh, i worked uh, right away i started working on some big movies um i worked on the fan pro 2 those were giant movies in los angeles back in in the mid 90s and then i went on to work uh i i'll list my resume of great movies let me <laughs> think that i got uh, there's something about mary that was a lot uh -huh, of work yeah that must um, be fun. Scream. That was mm -hmm. another big one. You you don't really know when you're working on a movie what it's going to become, and that's one of the great things about being on a movie set is that you kind of like Scream, for instance. It's quite we, a small production, right? Scream, the first uh -huh. one anyway. Well, it was quite a small production, the first one. Well, am I right in thinking yeah, that? Was, yeah, uh, totally. It was. I mean, it was a Wes Craven film in the sense that they did have a proper budget for what we had to shoot and everything, but it was for sure. Um, not some giant movie, but mm. it turned into being one of the biggest kind of cult classics that we know Absolutely. now nowadays. Um, one of the most so famous kind of funny horror films of all time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which, again, at the time, we just thought it was this kind of dumb slasher movie. And then yeah. when it came out, we were like, oh, my God, this is great. You know, it was such, such a big kind of plus to, to working on that. And then... Um, I fast forward to, well, I worked on uh, the Charlie's Angels movies, which were fun. Um, worked on uh, Spider Man, the original, like Tobey Maguire Spider Man movies, yeah, a little yeah. bit. But th those were um, a lot of fun. Who I Went, get told um, that I look like all of the time. I get that all of the time I would, that I look like Tobey Maguire. <laughs> I, I, if that. If that bugs you, I don't think you look at him like oh, him at thank all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, yeah, so so those movies were fun, and then I went on to working on some of the Marvel movies that started coming. The beginning, I was on Iron Man, which I think is a really mm -hmm. great movie, but it's also, of course, the real beginning to what we now know as yeah. movies. I'm, I'm sorry, everybody. Marvel's for my... domination. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's all my fault. <laughs> yeah, so that was fun to get on those movies, and then somewhere around uh, in... 2007 i think it was i got to go to china and work on a movie called the mummy three that was a cool experience to get to go to china i was over there for like six months that was a really great show that that gave me a lot of uh, experience in the kind of international filmmaking way i really enjoyed that a lot the crews over there were excellent everybody just mm -hmm. it was a lot of fun um and uh, when i came back on that 
was just working on some TV series with my now partner, Ray Gonzalez, and uh, my partner. May have lost Stephen a little bit there. Let's see if we can get him back. Yay. Oh, yeah, we're back. There we go. Yeah. So, um, we, my partner Evan. <laughs> the joys of doing this over Skype over the internet. Can I, I come back? Put I back in. in a different position. There we go. Let's You're back. <laughs> Do a little Vogue thing for every time I come back. <laughs> Stop motion uh, live streams. But yeah, so Ev Evan's got True Blood, and he brought me and Ray on the show to work on it, and then that's kind of from there is where Quasar happened. And then I think I did gotcha. one show with Ray after that. It was this uh, TNT TV series called uh, Last Ship. Um, and that okay. was my last show. And then I went to be the CEO as Quas uh, of Quasar Science, and then that was that for... Yep. I think I did a couple of days here and there on a show since then, but definitely uh, I'd like, it would be nice to go back and be a ring gaffer because it yeah, feels like it? it would be stress now. Like when I used to do it and it was my job, it was super high stress because I was just like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? But now after Quasar, it'd be a dream. <laughs> be yeah. Great. I imagine you'd find it more stressful than, <laughs> than memory is serving. <laughs> I, th I think I probably have forgotten what it's like, though. The first yeah. day I would be like, I wouldn't even know what this equipment is. I, I actually, it's so funny. I, I, I was joking the other day. I don't think I've rigged too many LEDs in my life, actually. By the time I was getting out is when kind of things like the Gemini and the spot, sky panel and things like that were starting to come out, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and I kind of bowed out as well at that time. I mean, that grounding, though, and the, the experience that you must have got by working on those productions must just inform pretty much every choice you're making nowadays, right? Yeah. Well, we, we don't presume too much. I mean, just because we worked on movie sets doesn't mean we know everything and we still try and do plenty of market research and figure out what everybody wants. We ask, you know, we ask the actual people that use the lights, of course, sure. what they think. But... Definitely, I think it makes a huge difference in the way we come about the product. And you know what it makes? It makes a huge difference in how accountable we are, I think. But one of the things that Quasar is always, we, we admit when we're failing, we, we take care of the customer when our lights don't work, our customer service, we try. We know what it's like to be on set and have everyone staring at you because the light's not turning on, right? So that right there is something that we pride ourselves on. If you've got a problem with our equipment, you call us right away and we treat it like it's the most serious thing ever because we really understand what that moment is like where you know, nobody, nobody enjoys that being on set um, with, that, with the lights kind of failing on you. So that's one of the things I think sets Quasar apart from a lot of the competition is that kind of kind of understanding of the of the pressure being on a a movie set is 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 some kind of weird form of special forces activity in a weird way where lives aren't on the line here but at the same time we treat it like they are yeah, so uh, <laughs> you know so whenever something is going wrong it's uh it's it's a tense moment on set so everybody uh deserves the best chance they have to get the day done that's for sure Absolutely. I mean, the the experience, it, it's about understanding the feedback that you get. I mean, and when and, and let's, let's say this was a company making the product, same products that you do, but with nobody there having any on set experience, it just becomes so much more difficult to interpret any feedback that you're getting, whether that's product feedback or service feedback, like you, you mentioned, no matter what it is, it's just this extra layer of difficulty for them, which you guys don't have because you it, it can't be difficult for you to empathize with your customer base because you've been your customer base. Exactly. And I think it's, it's profoundly important. I think uh, a lot of the companies are bringing kind of, you know, users, the field, the, the, the guys that are in the field to, to really let them kind of help inform what they need to be doing. Because again, the whole rigging system on our, lights that's that's because we just you know half the stuff you need to do with a light is behind the light it's not mm -hmm. what comes out of the light you have to be able to 
store the light on the truck. You need to be able to rig it now really fast and easy without a bunch of complication or without too many pieces or having to pull a bunch of stuff off the cart or all of this kind of nonsense. So I think all that is kind of really important. It's just, again, about um, not having problems because we're all just obstacle kind of avoiders, right? We're just trying to get through the day. We navigate all the obstacles, make sure that nobody yells at us and that we get our paycheck. <laughs> and so, again, I think it's really important to kind of think on all that stuff. And, and having the experience a little bit, again, I, I don't try and be too cocky about it. There's a bunch of stuff that, that I don't know about filmmaking all the time. That's why we have a great team that's pretty well rounded here uh, as far as what their overall experience is on set. Um, so I think that helps a lot as well. Even if you did know everything in the way those productions, everyone does it differently. Every DP works differently. Every, you know, there's a million and one ways to do any of this. It's creative yeah. at the end of the day. So it will always say be that, changing. I, I would say that the biggest thing that people can do to help themselves now on a set is just, well, the first one you can do is pay attention. That's always been the number one rule of being on a movie set. That uh, You can learn really fast. Just pay attention to everything that's going on. Stay out of the way. Yep. So that's, I think, really important. But um, also, you know, there's there's all this new science going on in the lights. There's all this new science with color and camera sensors and everything going on. And you can really, not only can you learn enough to protect yourself on the day from any embarrassing, you know, post-production impacting mistakes... But at the same time, there's all these things you can do with a digital camera sensor and an LED light that's got RGB enabled, for instance, that you've never been able to do with, 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 with technology before for making cool imagery and all of that stuff. So now is the number one time to be out there making content if that's what you ever wanted to do. It's like, I mean, you, you got... You got people in their 50s getting back into skateboarding, you might as well get into content creation if you ever wanted to do it because the barriers are just nothing there. I mean, I'm, you know what I mean? I'm sure the people in the 20s would have told me in the 80s that my barriers were nothing, of course, but now it's really true. There's just so much you can do with the technology. So back to my point, though, you have to learn it. You have to practice. You have to get proficient at the tools. You... I mean, one of the big things I say that um, hopefully doesn't get me fired is <laughs> that you don't need any lights from the start. So you don't need lights to make it. If it's dark and you want to see what you're doing, then you need lights, and that's where that all comes from. And I'm not trying to be snarky. It's just that don't ever assume that the reason you can't make content is because you don't have all the equipment. Sure. That's the first mistake everybody makes, right? Just who cares? Grab your old VHS camera. If you have to, just do it. You know, make art and then like forget light it. Somebody will find it later. Yep. Exactly. So I think, you know, you can, you can make a better looking project. I think what I'm driving towards here with this rant is that you can make a really good looking project on a really crappy camera. Um, and you can make a really beautiful camera look crappy because you didn't light it good or so forth and so on. So just practice, 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 um, and that'll get you everything that you need to be able to make content. Something I repeat over and over again, if you want to be a filmmaker, don't, don't get a job in the film industry. <laughs> yes, shouldn't be a job. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think that's a fantastic place to to leave it there. Um, so um, thank you so much for joining me for a start. That's a, I mean, what time is it over there? It must be 9.30 now or something, right? It's time for another cup of coffee. Time for a cup of coffee, exactly. <laughs> so thank you for giving up your morning and getting out of bed to come talk to us. Um, really appreciate it. Um, and well, anyone watching this at home, if you've got any product questions at all about Quasar Science, just get in touch with us here at ProV. We can reach out to the UK representatives. We can talk to Quasar. We'll, we, um, we'll help get those questions answered for you. But yeah, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate it to, to, to you and all the listeners that are watching or will watch this. I really thank you for the time. It's been, it's been fun, and I really appreciate it, Carl. Awesome stuff. And thank you, everyone, for watching, um, and we will see you very soon. Bye.
like a fall. 